Last week, I shared with you all an email I'd gotten from a first-year teacher struggling to bounce back after having made some mistakes and having some conflict with some parents. And so if you haven't already, you should go back and give episode 114 a listen, especially if you have ever made a mistake or had a bad parent-teacher conference. I think it will hopefully encourage you. And now in today's episode, I kind of want to talk about another conversation that I had with this teacher where we got onto the subject of how to project confidence even when you don't feel that way. Like how do I act confident in the classroom, especially in my first year or so of teaching when I feel like I have zero confidence? And so that is what today's episode is all about. Let's get into it. This is Secondary Science Simplified a podcast for secondary science teachers who want to engage their students and simplify their lives. I'm Rebecca Joyner from It's Not Rocket Science. As a high school science teacher turned curriculum writer, I am passionate about helping other science teachers love their jobs, serve their students, and do it all in only 40 hours a week. Are you ready to rock the time you spend in your classroom and actually have a life outside of it? You are in the right place, teacher friend. Let's get to today's episode. Okay, so you may have seen the title of this podcast, How to Act Confident When You're Not, and been like, awesome, she's going to give me all the answers. Here's my answer for you of how do I project confidence that I've got it all together even if I don't have it? The answer is you don't, okay? Truly, that's the answer. I could end the podcast right now, but then it would only be, what, two minutes long? So I will expand on it for your sake. And that's what I want to start off by saying, like, I get the urge to want to feel this way, especially if you are a newer teacher. You've probably heard a million people tell you that you need to fake it till you make it, okay? But I think especially if you struggle with anxiety or if you're like a recovering perfectionist, this motto, it's not going to actually help you. Like, I feel like fake it till you make it is just like mentally power through it. It's just like, you can't just like make yourself feel that way. Okay. So instead, this is how I think it is better to approach this idea of having confidence when you don't have it. And that is instead of, you know, acting some type of way that you're not, it's be honest and be humble with your students. Okay. You are not on a pedestal. You are not a perfect person. You make mistakes all of the time, just like your students do. And you don't know everything. And I think it is so good for our students to see that, to see your humility and and admitting those things because they rarely see it. All that they're seeing coming through their phones that they have their faces glued to is confidence, confidence, confidence. Y'all, I will never get over my favorite like reels or like I I watch TikToks on Instagram as reels, but like TikToks are when people show videos of like 14 year olds nowadays and they like have glammed out makeup, perfect hair, cute clothes on, and they're doing some sort of like dance. And then it's like me when I was 14 and it's some, it cuts to like someone's home video of them singing a Spice Girl song and like just with the retainers and it's like absolutely tragic. And I like could not relate to that more. I think what our students have projected at them is this picture of perfection and they don't need to see more perfect people. They need to see more humble people. They need to see humility in action, okay? And I think it's just really natural to kind of think of your teacher as, even if they don't like you, as like just so other. I mean, I'm sure all of y'all remember ever seeing any of your teachers outside of school like running into a teacher in a grocery store and they have like alcohol in their cart and you freak out because it just feels so weird and wrong. But it's like, no, like they're like a a grown adult human. Like they're over 21 in the United States. They can buy alcohol and it's fine, but it feels so weird because it's so hard to imagine your teacher outside the classroom. You're like, no, they just live in here all the time. That is what our students naturally are coming in with. And so one of the best things we can do is humanize ourselves in front of them. Okay, and I got a crash course in this my last full year teaching in the classroom, uh, unintentionally. (laughs) A crash course I did not sign up for. Um, I've talked about it before, but like we struggled with unexplained infertility. That was our diagnosis for over a year. It ended up being 34 months of trying until we became pregnant for the first time. But that was after we'd already adopted our oldest. So 
my students had, I'd been very private about our infertility stuff, but they probably knew something was up because I was leaving all the time for doctor's appointments and blood draws and, you know, scans and things like that as we awaited the diagnosis. And then when we did decide to pursue adoption instead of fertility treatments, I was very open with my students about it because uh, if you've ever adopted, it's it's kind of chaotic. Um, someone told me once that people in crisis act like they are in crisis. And a lot of these expectant parents are in crisis. And so, you know, you're getting a call like very last minute to drive up maybe somewhere to meet somebody or to show them your book or to meet with a social worker, meet with a doctor to review, you know, a case study for a potential situation. Like there's just a lot of chaos. And so I felt like I kind of had to tell my students about it so they would know why I was just bopping out randomly to take phone calls. And, you know, my teacher next door was stepping in. So I was honest with them. And I was honest with them when I got, or when we got our first adoption placement. And we thought we were going to adopt a little girl in January. And I prepared them for maternity leave and what that was going to look like. And the day that we got the call that she was in labor and she wanted us to pack our bags to like come to the hospital. I told the kids like, see you in nine weeks, you know, or see you in eight weeks, whenever, however long I was planning to take for maternity leave. And then she ended up deciding to parent her child, which is a hundred percent her right to do. But then I had to come back to work and my students saw like so much humanity in me. Like I was struggling. I was upset. You know, I was on the brink of tears a lot of the time and they saw that. And I think it was really, really good for them. I have some girls from that group of students that I taught them. I had taught them. They were seniors. My last year of teaching, and I had been with them for four years, I had been their biology teacher, their physical science teacher, some of their AP biology teachers. So I'd had them several times and we got really close. And even now, like when I'll post a picture of my kids, because we have three beautiful children now, they'll message me and be like, it is so crazy to see what has happened in your family after being there for the beginning of it. And what a gift it was to like just witness it. So I just want to encourage you It's okay to be imperfect and to be honest and to humble yourself before your students. And I think the other way I experienced it that year was when I taught AP biology for the first time. Y'all, I straight up had to tell my students, and these are students I'd already had, like I said, for two other science classes. Like they knew me and they knew I was on it and I was sharp and I ran a tight ship. And I had to say day one, like I basically know as much AP biology as most of y'all. Like I'm going to be studying right alongside with you. Y'all are used to me giving you a study guide with objectives and vocabulary for the unit at the start of the unit because I've already written the whole unit and the test. And right now I'm just going on a day by day basis and I'm going to do my best to get you the study guide at least two days before the test. Like that was just where we were at y'all. And they would ask me questions in class. I'd be like, yeah, literally no clue. Let's Google it. Like, and we died laughing because we kept joking like Google is Miss jo- Joyner's co-teacher. And Paul Anderson, I couldn't think of his name for a second. Paul Anderson from Bozeman Science. He is also your assistant teacher because we watched all of his videos. So I just think it's better to be honest and humble than it is to be fake confident. Okay, so I wanna encourage you to be humble. I think it'll really serve your students. The second thing I want to say is you can feel confident though and assured, I think in two things, you know, let's not put our confidence and our hope and our, the rock that we're standing on. Let's not put it in false things, like just trying to, you know, make ourselves feel better so we can suck it up and get in there. Let's put it on things that actually matter so that then when your anxiety or whatever rears its ugly head, you can point to actual truths that can't be argued because they're facts. Okay, so let's let's look at the facts, the things that you can really actually feel confident in. One, the systems you have put into place. Okay, y'all know I'm a huge fan of systems, routines, procedures, and not only establishing them, but clearly communicating them and consistently reinforcing them for maximum effectiveness. I really don't like conflict. Okay, I don't like dealing with it with my, with my students and classroom management. And I don't like it with my own children. Like it's exasperating. I don't want to sit there and, and constantly have to, you know, do conflict resolution with you. I don't like it. I don't like disciplining you, but here's what helps me. I feel like I could have a level head and be super calm and not get emotional and just be very black and white when it comes to classroom management, conflict resolution, whatever. When I have clearly established, communicated and reinforced fairly whatever system, routine, or procedure I have. So for example, if I have said, you know, I do not accept late work, let's just use this example. I've said it, 
I've told students a thousand times. I've warned them. It's There's a poster in the room that says no late work is accepted. And then a student comes at you and is being disrespectful because you won't accept their late work. And they start talking back to you. You can say, I have a policy where I do not accept late work. I have communicated it one, two, three, however many times in XYZ manners. There's a sign right here that reminds you that, you know, this, I put it in the syllabus that you signed at the beginning of the year that I wouldn't take late work. I've made myself clear that late work will not be accepted. And now you're being disrespectful to me about something that I clearly warned you about. And we will not have disrespect in this classroom. You will not speak to me that way. And I will not speak to you that way. And so now I'm going to remove you from the classroom until you're ready to be respectful, you know? And I feel like I can actually be calm like that because I've made it so clear. I feel that way with my kids too. Like if I say, hey, don't pull your sister's hair. Okay, they do it again. If you pull your sister's hair again, you will be disciplined. You will be taken out of this room and disciplined. They do it again. I immediately walk. I'm able to discipline them and talk to them after and say, I told you if you did this, this was the result. You still chose to do that. You have free will. You chose it. Here's the consequence. And I can say really calm. I feel like the times I don't feel calm are when I feel guilt because I didn't really clearly communicate it, but now I've got, or I didn't really consistently reinforce what I said. And so now I've kind of let it get to the point where it's a little out of control and it's kind of my fault, but now I'm angry and now I'm like annoyed that you got to this point and I'm putting it on you when really it was on me. And so I really think if you can establish some systems, rules, routines, whatever, and be super consistent with those then you can have confidence that you've done kind of that back work and that proactive work. Everyone always asks me, how many do I need? I always say, however many you need to keep you calm, but that you will also consistently reinforce. Some people I know don't like to have more than three because they're like, I'll never actually do more than X, Y, Z. Other people I know have 25. They have a whole list of things, the way we do this, the way we do that, my rule for this, because that's what they need to stay calm. And I think it's totally fine either way. Now, if you're like, how do I even get started? Like, what systems do I need? What are you even talking about? I have some other podcast episodes I've done before that I think might be helpful to listen to and kind of get you some ideas to get started. So one of those is Last year, episode 76, I did like an end of year reflection and I kind of walk you through a way to audit kind of your year. And you could go ahead and listen to that and do that again now, mid-year, and just kind of say, okay, where are we? How do I feel about where we've been? That kind of thing. Another episode would be episode 33. That was at the beginning of the year last year, the beginning of school year. And we talked about mistakes to avoid at the beginning of the school year. And I talk about some of the systems I think you need to teach right away. And again, It's not the end of the world if you don't do it at the beginning of the year. It's obviously better to teach these things from day one, but at any point, you can draw a line in the sand and say, we're gonna do things differently from now on the school year, okay? So I think episode 33 would be helpful. I think episode 74 is really helpful if you specifically have a lot, if you lack a lot of confidence around labs, if labs are especially a time where you're like, I don't know what I'm doing and I need to pretend like I do, I think episode 74 would really help you. So I would listen to that. and then. Lastly, just with classroom management in general, I did a whole series on it this last August. The episode 91 of that series, I talked about some of these routines and procedures like I just mentioned that I make sure to clearly communicate and consistently reinforce with my students. So episodes 33, 74, 76, 91, I will link all of those in the show notes, which is always able to be found at itsnotrocketscienceclassroom.com slash whatever the episode is. So like for this one, slash episode 115. Or depending on your podcast player, sometimes you can just kind of like swipe up when you're listening to an episode and you'll see it all there. But it kind of depends on where you're listening. So you can feel confident in the systems that you've put in place and actually taught your students. And then the second thing I wanna say is you can feel confident in the passion you have for your students and for doing this job well. I know for a fact that if you are listening to this podcast, you are passionate about your students and you are passionate about doing your job well. You would not be taking the time to listen to this if you weren't, okay? So find some peace and some assurance in that truth. You love your students. You want them to learn and you're gonna do the best you can as an imperfect person to teach them, okay? but it's okay and really encourage for you to admit your imperfection here. 
So if you are looking kind of for like an action step at the end of this episode, like where do I go from here? I would encourage you to reflect on your current systems. Use some of those episodes I referenced to kind of guide you through it and maybe create some new systems and procedures that you're going to teach your students for the rest of the year to kind of help you there and have confidence in those that you're, you know, you're being proactive about some of these things. I think that would really help. And I would love it if you haven't left a review to do so today. And I want to encourage you to leave a review if you've ever lacked confidence in this job. If you've ever tried to fake it till you make it, leave a review today and hopefully be encouraged to feel like you don't have to pretend any longer and you can be honest and, you know, humble yourself before your students. All right, teacher friends, that wraps up today's episode. If you're looking for an easy way to start simplifying your life as a secondary science teacher, head to it's not rocket science classroom.com slash challenge to grab your classroom reset challenge. And guess what? It's totally free. Thanks so much for tuning in and I'll see you here next week. Until then, I'll be rooting for you, teacher friend. <laughs>